Saving Toby from Sweet Hope by Mary Bucci Bush. Toby mentioned for Osvaldo to follow him closer to the river's edge. Sand ripples showed underneath the water until, a yard from shore, the bottom disappeared into murkiness. The sandbar was five feet wide and nearly 15 feet as long, an easy target. Toby's stones hit the edge of the bar, but Osvaldo's always splashed short. Soon they were panting from the exertion. Toby poked his toes into the water. Osvaldo took off his shoes and stood beside Toby, the cool water tickling his feet. Toby told Osvaldo how a whole steamship with hundreds of people on board was sitting at the river's bottom right there where he was pointing. He repeated words for Osvaldo to say, River, gold, pirates. The river flowed steadfastly past them. Ocean waves pushed a shell or a clump of weeds onto the shore, but then sucked it out, then threw it back on shore again. But whatever this river took did not come back. Go on, Toby encouraged him, knowing the dangers of playing in the forbidden river. Go swim, he pointed to the sandbar. Swim on the sandbar, he, he motioned to his waist, assuring Osvaldo that the water was only that deep. Toby found a stick, then poked it into the water as far in front of him as he could reach. See, ain't even deep, he said. They were standing in the shallow water to their ankles, whipping the sticks in the water and stirring up the muddy bottom while the woods behind them thrummed with insects and bird song. Big old giant fish live out in the deep middle, Toby said. He jumped up once he jumped up one time, swallow a whole river boat, all one gulp. He squatted down so low that water lapped at his rear end. Then they were both sitting in the water. Toby flung off his ragged shirt. They leaned back to their elbows and let their legs float, the current swaying, to swaying them toward the landing. Osvaldo heard a sound, like branches moving or someone walking, coming from the woods behind them, above the sound of the river. He touched Toby's arm and motioned for him to listen but no parents emerged, no sisters. It gave Osvaldo a creepy feeling, as if the woods were alive and had eyes. A great white bird rose up from the grassy shore nearby and flapped across the water, pulling its long, dark legs in close to its body, its bulky wings almost dipping into the water as it skimmed the surface. And then the bird rose higher, stretched its crooked neck, made a graceful swoop, turn, a swooping turn and landed farther down near the shore. Osvaldo asked Toby if he'd seen the bird, but Toby merely flopped onto his stomach and rested his chin in his hands, his legs floating behind him. Water licked at his face and laughed and raised his chin. He had done this only once before, alone, but now with another boy beside him, it was... It was as if he had always played in the river. Then a turtle floated by, and the boys waded in water to their knees to retrieve it. Now that Toby was in the water and his feet were still touching the bottom, all the warnings he had heard about playing in the river vanished. It wasn't until his foot slipped and he felt his legs drop, dropping, and then his body following, that something awoke in him. He thrashed his arms and screamed for help. Osvaldo took a step toward him and then stopped. Toby churned his arms toward the shore as a current pulled him slowly in the opposite direction. His mouth opened as he shut and tried to cry out for help while spitting to, to keep the water from choking him. Osvaldo turned toward the trees. Ioto, he shouted, Ioto. He turned back and shouted in Italian for Toby to swim. And then he tried to reach out an arm for him. Finally, he ran to the stick the boy had been playing with and called for Toby to grab it. But the stick was ridiculously short. All the while, Toby's panicked eyes stayed on Osvaldo. His face bobbed farther out in the water. So 
that he looked like a flower, a dark floating blossom. Osvaldo stared mutely at the bobbing water, then took off running for the trees. Their dinner break was nearly over when Fancy Hall and Amelia Pascala each looked up, their noses raised as if catching something in the air. Their eyes moved slowly over the children and adults sprawled around them, and their ears listened, although neither of them knew in those moments what they were listening for. Their eyes met briefly as they rose to their feet. By the time they were standing, what their bodies had unknowingly sensed turned to sudden consciousness. Within seconds, their entire group was running into the woods, calling for the boys. They broke through the trees onto the sandy clearing at the same time. Osvaldo leaped from the sand into the scrub oaks, shouting incoherently. Step Paul reached out as if to steady himself and caught the boy in the, by the arm. For a moment, Osvaldo dangled in midair while a dozen pairs of startling eyes watched his churning feet, the great river flowing behind him. Then Step dropped the boy and they ran for the river. Fancy screamed when she saw her son slapping at the water, a dull, exhausted look in his face. He had already been carried another 20 feet downstream and farther away from the shore. Step splashed into the water while his wife followed, her arms stretched toward the boy. The others grabbed her skirt to keep her from throwing herself to the river. Step's foot slipped at the drop-off, and he plunged into the water to his waist. He struggled against the current to keep his footing. Someone called for a rope, and the scrawny old man ran back to the wagons. Another man cursed himself for not bringing the rope when they had first run into the woods. Where else would young boys be, after all, than in the river where they weren't supposed to be? As if on cue, the black Americans joined hands, making a chain of their bodies that allowed Step to venture further into the water. The Italians added their own bodies as links to the chain, but the water became too deep and the current too strong. Daddy, Toby gasped as the river tugged at him, the distance widening between them. Amelia pulled Osvaldo close and called the girls to her side. Pray for the little boy, she told them. Seraphin waded into the water, holding on to the outstretched arms until he reached Step Hall, the shouting and crying close to his ears. He grabbed Step's arm and leaned over the river, reaching for Toby as if beckoning him from the water. The motion jarred him once again as he was touching his brother Valerio's hand. He held the fingers at a moment, and then Valerio disappeared. He let go of Step Hall, his feet touched for a moment, and just a moment before the current lifted him and started swimming. Fool, Seraphin, Amelia shrieked, come back. Osvaldo watched in horror as his father carried away. Daddy, he cried out, where are you going? He knew he was the cause of this. Me scusa, Osvaldo cried. Seraphim had seen foolish young men who thought they could fight and with the sea and win, a dangerous attitude for a fisherman to have. He never thought of himself as a man, but now he felt his anger against the river rising, and he tried to calm it. It was the anger that killed you. It was easy to reach the boy as he knew it would be. Returning would be another matter. Toby turned to his eyes to, to Seraphin like a baby waking from sleep. Stay bene, Seraphin told him. You're going to be okay. He slipped his arms under Toby's, lifting him in the water so that he could breathe. Toby whimpered. The water cradled Seraphim and the boy and the boy as they each held each other. Then Seraphim turned his head sharply to see how far he had drifted from the shore, and the sight shocked him. I may as well be in the middle of the ocean, he thought. The water felt surprisingly cold now. It tugged at his legs, and for a moment he kicked out violently, thinking he had become snagged in something, but it was only the current playing tricks on him. He plowed with water. He plowed the water with his right arm while he fought to keep above the water with his other with his other. He heard nothing from the shore, but he saw tense, frightened faces watching him, the way he had watched twice from the boat. The cold water made his legs heavy and sluggish. The boy was weightless behind him, an empty burlap slap. Stay, Bene, he called out, his lips brushing the boy's cheek like a kiss, 
There was no answer, just a slight movement, perhaps a splash of a hand. His arms ached. He wondered how such a small child had been able to swim against the current for so long. He told himself to try not to think about the pain and the distance between himself and the shore. It would have been hard enough to swim with both arms, but this way holding on to the boy it seemed impossible. Just one more stroke, one more, and then another, and then another. Lazaro moved, waved his arms at Seraphin as the group followed him slowly downstream. Be strong, Lazaro shouted. Don't give up. Suddenly, Seraphin was afraid. It was if the river had stopped for a moment and he could see everything clearly. It had not crossed his mind when he stepped into the water that he might not come out alive. Now he saw terrified looks on his wife and children and best friend. Don't give up. Hold on, Lazaro called, and Seraphin was stunned to realize he was drowning. What would happen to his wife and children? How could they how could he leave them alone in the hell he had brought them to and the pain of his death to further burden them visiting him at heiner cemetery where the rest of the godforsaken italians lay a black man waded into the water extending a rope to seraphin and then letting it drop where he saw the rope was useless come on lazaro said just a little more seraphin blinked his eyes hard trying to clear the water from them and he was surprised a second time to realize he'd actually inch himself closer to the shore, even though the current carried him downstream. Just his fate, he thought, to die like this, not a mule's length from being saved. The group formed a human chain again, eased deeper into the water. Seraphin found himself looking into the face of Stepal, who held the rope. They were shouting at him to and at each other, but a rushing sound filled his ears as he could not make out their words. Step leaned into the river while the others held him. His face tensed, his eyes narrowed as he studied Seraphin's face with a look of someone backed into the corner and gauged his last desperate move. Then Step Hall tossed a loop of rope with his one free hand. Seraphin watched its slow fight in the air. It seemed to hang suspended in front of his eyes before plopping gently in the water a few feet from him. Several times, Step pulled the noose, then tossed it again. Finally, he stopped and cursed himself, fretting over the rope as if searching for a flaw in it, then leaned forward once more, set a steady gaze on Seraphin's face, and let the rope go. It sailed before Seraphin's eyes for a moment, a fleeting shadow, a leaf blowing in the wind, before floating down over his head, Step let out a quick triumphant shout, then pulled. Seraphin felt the pressure against the back of his neck. He raised his head in the water and arched his neck to keep the rope from slipping off. And then Step reached out, snagged Seraphin's hand, and pulled pulled him in. Step and Fancy Hall snatched their son from Seraphin as he collapsed on the knees ashore. He felt the air heave around him, like a gust blowing in and out of a room. He was it was his family gathering at his side. And then there came a barely discernible touch, Amelia's hand on his arm, removing the rope from his neck. Seraphin noticed the same hazy way the commotion, uh, way the commotion a, di a short distance from him. Fancy Hall crying and rocking her son as the others pried the boy out of their hands and laid him on the grass. Step slapped at his son and shook him, saying, Come on, boy, come on, boy, though uh, through gritted teeth until finally the boy coughed and vomited. Fancy touched Toby's face, his arms, or his chest, his arms. Did you ever think, she cried, oh, Lord, did you ever think? Amelia slapped Seraphin across the face with such force that he fell sideways. What the hell did you think you were doing out there, go going out there, leaving us, she screamed at him. I know your men die in water. Dio Santo, Fiorenza said, pulling her away. Amelia cursed, Seraf uh, cursed Seraphin, beating at his face while Fiorenza struggled to hold back. Lazaro pinned Amelia's arms to her sides until she went still and she began sobbing. Seraphim righted himself, before, right himself on his knees, taking his children's hands for support. It's okay, he tried to say, but 
What came out sounded like he was attempting